Joining us now, Cheng Li is director of the John L. Thornton China Center and a senior fellow in foreign policy at the Brookings Institution from Beijing. Ching Du Xu is a political analyst at China Radio International. And with us in the studio, Mark Ross is founder of Caracol Communications and an expert in China-US business relations. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Ching Do, let me start with you up there in Beijing. Uh, during the election campaign here in the United States, and even after President Trump was elected president, he had very harsh words for China, called China a currency manipulator, criticized the Chinese uh, role in the South China Sea, said that China was not playing fairly uh, as far as its uh, trade was concerned. But last week, the Chinese foreign minister, Wang Yi, said that there are more that these two countries have in common rather than their differences. Let's take a listen to what the foreign minister of China had to say. The common interests of China and the United States are far greater than the differences. Strengthening cooperation between the two sides is necessary for global stability and for the expectations of people from the two countries and the world. So given what we heard there from the Chinese foreign minister, how do you see relations evolve between these two countries? Well, I think, um, you know, if you look at, at the past 37 years, since the two countries forged a diplomatic relationship, uh, you know, uh, probably the relationship has never been stronger than today. And also the two countries are having more and more common interests in addressing global affairs, say, uh, whether it be it like, uh, you know, the fight against uh, terrorism, uh, climate change and also uh, nuclear non-proliferation, things like that. So the two countries are working closely. And the U.S. is not able to solve, uh, say, Iran, uh, Iranian nuclear issue without the help of China. And uh, yes, the two countries are sort of like entering a new stage you know, with China is catching up economically. And also militarily, China is closing the gap with the United States. So there is a suspicion in Washington, you know, whether China is going to replace uh, the United States supreme position as the only superpower. And of course, in China, there is suspicion whether the U.S. is going to contain the rise of China. But I think if you look at the past, uh, uh, you know, decades, I think that if there is any key to this. Uh, relationship uh, to the maintaining management of the re relationship uh, that is uh, they need to be uh, keep it open to each other and the cooperation probably i agree with uh, the foreign minister cooperation is the only way forward you know there's no alternative uh, because of uh, their the size and also the power of these two countries if there's conflict say that's uh, that's a consequence that we can't afford to have Cheng Li, one of the bedrock policies that govern relations between these two countries is the One China policy. Now, President Trump did throw a little bit of doubt on that shortly after he became president. But now, in a telephone call with uh, the Chinese President Xi Jinping, President Trump has reiterated that the United States has support for the One China policy. How important is this issue? I think it's very important. I will even say this is an informal force communicate between the United States and China, which all emphasize that one China policy. Now, of course, that uh, people said that uh, we should not, uh, some people in both China or United States said that uh, we should not uh, take uh, President Obama, uh, President uh, Donald Trump's words too seriously. He has big mouth, and uh, why we uh, think that uh, his words count. But I think uh, in this area, that uh, his words count, uh, uh, you know, uh, really uh, seriously. Now, also ironically, if we look at the, the, his campaign promises that he delivered, you know, uh, during the campaign. And in the first months, actually, he really delivered, uh, whether it be the end of the TPP and uh, the start to end of the Obamacare and the Muslim ban and uh, the regulation Wall Street and even to build a wall uh, around the, uh, the board with Mexico. So I think that in a way that um, we should take some of his words very seriously. So as for the one China policy, what he said in that conversation with Xi Jinping is very, very important. Uh, I think that's the, uh, uh, lay out the, again, new foundation and the interim agreement uh, between two top leaders and the two countries. All right, Mark, let's look at the trade relationship between these two countries. As Cheng Li pointed out, the United States has withdrawn from TPP negotiations. Uh, China was not a party to those negotiations, uh, I should say. Uh, but President Trump has threatened to impose tariffs on Chinese imports. Now, uh, the Chinese media, China Daily, points out that China is responsible for something like 2.6 million jobs here in the United States through this trade relationship. So where does it go to from here? Well, I think you have to, as Chung Li, I think, really said, you have to take what uh, Trump has said uh, very seriously, especially in this area. 
uh, not only as President Trump an economic nationalist, the team that he surrounded himself with between Wilbur Ross, uh, Peter Navarro, these gentlemen uh, very much see trade as a zero-sum game. Uh, there are winners and losers. They feel America has been treated poorly, not only with China, but frankly, every country, which is pretty amazing. Um, so I would take it very seriously. Now, obviously, the, the, the way our system is set up in the U.S., the president does have a tremendous amount of power in the trade area. But there are other branches of our government, obviously, the executive and the judicial branch that also have a say in this. So to say that there's going to be a tariff of 45 percent, I think, is a stretch. But do I think that the relationship is going to trade, be changed? Absolutely. And I think all sides should prepare for that. Yeah, Mark, it's the question of perceptions, because, you know, uh, the United States may say that it's getting uh, the worst deal in this relationship. But if we look at the figures, as I just pointed out, 2.6 million U.S. jobs uh, that are created by this relationship with China. And if you look at the main beneficiaries of Chinese manufacturing, it's lower-income Americans that benefit most from that. Well, I think Ameri all Americans benefit from trade, right. not only from China, but with Mexico, Canada, and et cetera. Uh, it is interesting, from World War II, our leadership in the U.S. has been very pro-trade, very engaged, be a leader in the world. Uh, this administration seems to have more of a uh, perception that we're a victim, we've been cheated, yeah. uh, and uh, we're, we're going to change it. And I think that is a very dynamic change. It's a huge inflection point that a lot of stakeholders need to identify. Right, Qingdao, there certainly is concern in China about what President Trump has been saying. You remember that during the uh, address that President Xi Jinping made at the World Economic Forum, he said that if there is a trade war between the United States and China, nobody will win. So is there a recognition, do you think, on both sides that they can't go down that road? Uh, no, it seems to me like uh, Washington is more about uh, this uh, men mentality of zero-sum mentality. And if you look at the principle they are following, you know, America first, you know, make America great again, basically they are talking about like, uh, uh, you know, U.S. will benefit from particular trade relationship with China, with Japan, with Mexico, with Germany. Uh, but now they say the U.S. is suffering from a trade deficit. I think, yes, I think a lot of people understand that there's a concern in the United States that's a genuine concern about the trade deficit with China. But at the same time, if you look at the trade, a, I mean, both nations benefit from this trade relationship. Uh, if there's an extra 45 percent tariffs or naming China as a currency manipulator, and I think, you know, yes, there will be trade con conflicts. You know, China could bring the U.S. to WTO for arbitration for this trade policy, and China could uh, choose to retaliate uh, with, uh, you know, targeting uh, U.S. Uh, uh, exported products in the Chinese market. Remember, China is the third largest uh, exporting market of U.S. products and also the fastest growing one. So China does have, uh, uh, you know, a number of cards to play to play along, let's say. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, both nations will suffer. U.S. consumers will also suffer from the, uh, uh, you know, the, the increase of the prices of the same stuff. You pay more. Uh, so I'm not sure, you know, until that day probably, you know, Washington will realize or, you know, both nations will realize confrontation is not the way forward. We need to sit down to talk through our differences, uh, I mean, even uh, to settle the disputes, like uh, to try to find a way to balance the trade probably right. uh, you know, through negotiation rather than trade war. Okay, China? Well, trade should not be zero-sum game, <clears throat> and otherwise that's, there's no incentive for trade. And I think that uh, uh, even uh, Trump administration, at least uh, uh, Trump himself uh, uh, probably recognized that. And uh, maybe there's some hardliners in, the, in his team that uh, would take a very harsh policy. But we should put in the perspective that uh, uh, over the past uh, few years, maybe even decade, China's middle class is ex ex expanding, but the American middle class is shrinking. Uh, of course, that the, uh, some of the uh, campaign rhetoric, you know, blaming everything to China is not fair. But on the other hand, there's a legitimate reason for U.S. This is actually, there's a consensus among the, uh, both Republican and Democrat. Even Hillary Clinton during her campaign also emphasized the, the trade issues. So I think that the Chinese audience should uh, be aware that certainly will not be 45% tariffs. That's not realistic. That's not fair. But uh, certainly not in the old sectors. But in some right. products, in some sectors, I think that uh, uh, almost for sure that Donald Trump will have the more tariffs. But uh, this has not only happened to China, but also happened to some other countries, even American allies. So it's not just to see that it's part of the uh, condemn China or blame things to China. So we really yeah. should uh, be serious about this negotiation. And uh, I think we should expect that uh, uh, 
the Trump administration will emphasize that issue. Mark, is it a question of broad uh, trade philosophy here? On the one hand, we have China, which has outlined uh, an outward-looking uh, policy, saying that the world has to be connected. Globalization has benefited China. It will benefit the rest of the world. Yet, on the other hand, we hear in the United States President Trump talking about America first, a very inward-looking policy. No, I agree. And I, I think um, I teach a course at George Washington University. In, in some ways, uh, what is happening in the politics, it's like a real-time classroom discussion. And I think the, the, the history of the U.S., though, frankly, has been very isolationist. And it really wasn't until the 40s where we became more pro-trade and engagement. So this, I, the Trump ideology, if you will, has always been in America, for sure. It's just that the leaders that have won the White House have had a different, more outward-looking view. Um, there's no doubt that there are certain elements uh, in this in the city and around the country that certainly are pro-trade, that depend on finding a, the best talent, the best products to manufacture and sell goods. Um, so it won't be easy for Trump to in, in, to do this. But that being said, there is certainly uh, this idea has been percolating for a number of years, certainly since the Great Recession of 2009, and um, we finally, the American people, finally elected somebody to take this all the way to the White House. So it's something to definitely take serious. Okay, we're going to take a break right now. Coming up more on the future of China-U.S. relations. Stay with us. You're watching the Heat.